Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science. In the headlines this week, extraordinary fossils have been discovered preserving the scaly skin of prehistoric flying reptiles, the most complete stegosaur skull ever found in Europe has been revealed, an important study has shown that dehorning rhinos is an effective way to save their lives, and much more. Before we get to the news, we've got a quick announcement at the end, so stick around to help us make 7 Days of Science even better. Our top story this week is the discovery of some extraordinary fossils of prehistoric flying reptiles known as pterosaurs, which preserve remains of soft tissues on their hands and feet, allowing us to see the traces of their scales and even the webbing between their toes. These fossils come from Jurassic-aged rocks in Germany and belong to a lineage of pterosaurs called the Tenochasmatids a fascinating group with diverse tooth and jaw anatomies, some of which may have been suspension feeders. One of the examined specimens includes a practically complete leg and foot, while the other preserves a partial leg with a foot, plus an almost complete wing. By closely examining the feet and shining UV light on them, paleontologists have revealed incredible details of the scales that would have cushioned the toes, and even remnants of webbing between the digits. Additionally, it's worth noting that the wonderful branching structures visible in these images don't actually have anything to do with the soft tissues of the animals, they're structures called dendrites that form from minerals, precipitating out of liquids. The small, rounded, pebble-like scales on the feet of these Tenochasmata pterosaurs are remarkably similar to the foot scales discovered in some other, more distantly related pterosaur species, such as those known from the much more ancient Ramphorhynchus, as well as much younger Ashdarchids. This suggests, therefore, that the anatomy of these scales was relatively conservative across all pterosaurs, with these shapes and structures evolving early on in the reptiles and then pretty much staying consistent throughout their evolution. This study also marks the first time that pterosaur hand scales have been reported, which is another exciting discovery. These hand scales are very similar to those observed on the feet, which makes sense considering the pterosaurs moved about on all fours when on the ground and so they'd need similar cushioning for their fingers. Interestingly, the traces of skin webbing, which you can see here, appear not only to be present between the toes, but also to extend back between the metatarsal bones, the actual bones of the foot itself. This implies that the foot bones were not tightly bound together and were in fact spaced from each other at the far end, if webbing was present to stretch between these bones. Evidence of webbing being this deep back in pterosaur feet has been discovered before, but these fossils provide the clearest view of it found so far, elucidating just what webbed pterosaur feet would have looked like. So, some very intriguing new data on pterosaur life appearance here, and a fantastic new study to start us off with. Up next in the paleontology news of the week, there's been another fantastic pterosaur discovery, as a new species of these prehistoric flying reptiles has just been named. Funnily enough, it's a new type of Jurassic Age pterosaur that was also uncovered in Germany, found in the same kinds of rocks as the feet and hands, the Sonhofen limestone. The fossil itself is only a part of an upper jaw, yet it preserves a beautiful row of teeth, and it's distinctive enough for paleontologists to determine what kind of pterosaur it was, as well as to establish that it's from a previously unknown species. They've called it Spathognathus roperi, with Spathognathus translating as spatula jaw, a fitting name for this animal, as the fossil indeed shows how the jaw expands into a spatula shape at the tip. Spathognathus is another member of the Tenochasmatid family of pterosaurs, a group that, as mentioned earlier, had very intriguing jaw and tooth anatomies that suggest at least some of these creatures were suspension feeders, filtering out tiny animals from the water by trapping them between their tightly packed teeth. However, Spathognathus has teeth suited to consuming harder prey items, potentially shellfish, as the teeth are more widely spaced and actually have cutting edges. So it shows that these pterosaurs were remarkably diverse in their feeding methods, and adds another species to our record of this fascinating Jurassic lineage. Also in the recent paleontology news, scientists have published their analysis of an extraordinary fossil discovery, the most complete skull of a stegosaur ever found in Europe. It was uncovered in Spain in late Jurassic aged rocks dating to approximately 150 million years ago. The fossil includes the back half of the dinosaur's skull, preserving the skull roof, which features distinct openings where muscles would have attached. Due to the well-preserved condition of the fossil, 
paleontologists have been able to determine that it belongs to the stegosaur species Dacentrurus armatus, which is also known from other European countries. The researchers have also revised our understanding of stegosaur evolution thanks to the new data provided by the skull. They found that stegosaurs can be divided into two main lineages, the stegosaurids and the hyungosaurids, and they've officially named a new group of stegosaurids, which they call Neostegosauria. So this incredible skull has helped massively to clarify the evolution of this remarkable group, and we now have an even better understanding of these fantastic dinosaurs. Our next story transports us to ancient China and explores the early domestication of pigs. A study published this week in the journal PNAS has analysed the dental calculus, which is mineralised plaque, from two sites in the lower Yangtze River region in South China, both dating back to the early Neolithic stage of human development. Together, these sites contain evidence from between 8,300 to 7,000 years ago. Within this dental calculus, the researchers discovered indications that wild boars were consuming cooked foods and human-associated waste, suggesting human-pig interaction on several levels, including scavenging near human settlements and the early domestication of pigs. Interestingly, this also included wild boar foraging completely beyond human influence. The researchers predict that wild boars were often drawn to larger human settlements as humans established themselves, cultivated food, and generated considerable waste that could be scavenged. The boars that were less aggressive towards humans would have been more likely to be domesticated, which began to pave the way for the domestication of boars into the pigs we recognise today. This presents a fascinating insight into the early interactions of a now familiar domesticated animal. In other news, astronomers have captured a fascinating image that they believe could be a gas giant still forming around its star. The star in question is RIK113, located about 431 light years away from our own system. A protoplanetary disk from this system was uncovered by a paper published last year, but this team used a different telescope, ESA's VLT, that's Very Large Telescope, to take another look. In doing so, they discovered two potential signals around the star that could indicate planets at the very beginning of their lives. This is not confirmation of the protoplanet's existence, but rather a suggestion that they could be there. Using modeling data, the team states that the structures detected are consistent with the presence of an embedded gas giant, with a mass anywhere between 10% to five times that of Jupiter's. One particularly alluring aspect of these observations is what this young star system looks like. The rings and inner spiral arms of the system are remarkably consistent with predictions of how forming planets shape the stellar disks in the early stages of a star system's life. These fabulous observations serve as an important tool in the belt for astronomers seeking to understand how our solar system and others came about. A story for cat lovers next, as a study published just over a week ago in PLOS One has looked into the role genetics play in certain behavioural traits, such as purring. Purring is a unique vocalisation in cats, and while it's believed that it may initially develop to signal good health to a mother, it continues beyond this early stage and is generally a sign of comfort, safety and general friendliness. It's worth noting that the exact function of purring remains unclear. That particular mystery was not the focus of this research. The paper also had a look at general vocalisations and stranger-directed aggression. The team from Kyoto University received a substantial amount of data from willing volunteer cat owners for their paper, and did indeed find a link between these behavioural traits and genetics. They discovered that cats with a short-type androgen receptor gene purred more than those with the long-type androgen receptor gene, at least with their owners who were responsible for this data. One idea as to why this may be is that vocal communication is less important for purebred cats, as they are more likely to carry the long androgen receptor gene. These cats are typically raised by humans from kittenhood, which naturally decreases the need to communicate with other cats. A fascinating study on one of humanity's most beloved animals. Hello Morgana, could you tell us what you think about this study please? Uh, yes. I find research on cats to be most agreeable. I shall now purr to please the audience. Thank you very much for your time. In other news, an important study has recently been published that assesses the effectiveness of various conservation efforts aimed at saving rhinos from poaching. 
it finds that only one of these efforts, the actual removal of the rhino's horn from the living animal, has significantly reduced the loss of these creatures. The study documented the poaching of nearly 2,000 rhinos from 2017 to 2023, across 11 southern African reserves, and examined how different anti-poaching methods impacted the survival of these animals. The researchers found that, although most investment is focused on initiatives like rangers, tracking dogs, and detection cameras, which do lead to the arrests of poachers, there was no statistical evidence showing that these methods actually reduce poaching. The sheer demand for rhino horn, the involvement of criminal syndicates, and the corruption of law enforcement mean that even with these risks, poaching persists, and in many cases, succeeds. According to this research, only dehorning live rhinos, thereby removing the reward, was able to reduce poaching, and quite dramatically too, by about 78%. Even then, dehorning must be undertaken regularly, as some poachers will still target the regrowing stumps. It's unfortunate that this must be done to the animals, but the valuable data from this long-term study demonstrates that it is an effective means to save their lives, and ultimately, their species. Finally for the news this week, a new study has shown that acidification is impacting our oceans more significantly than previously thought, and has been described as a ticking time bomb for marine ecosystems and coastal economies. Ocean acidification occurs when carbon dioxide is rapidly absorbed by seawater, reacting with water molecules, leading to an increase in ocean acidity and a decrease in the concentration of carbonate ions, crucial building blocks for the shells and hard parts of many animals. The study utilized new and historical physical and chemical measurements from ice cores, along with computer models and studies of marine life. Analysis of the data revealed that up to 60% of the global subsurface ocean has crossed a boundary thought to be a safe limit for acidification. Decreased calcium carbonate concentration can severely affect marine organisms, impacting their physiology, growth, survival, and reproduction. Organisms that produce calcium carbonate shells or skeletons, such as some corals, crustaceans, mollusks, and algae, are particularly at risk. With lower concentrations of carbonate, these organisms find it increasingly difficult to build or maintain their calcium carbonate structures, leading to slower growth rates and thinner shells. Their shells may even begin to dissolve. The scientists conducting the study states that the only way to address acidification globally is to reduce carbon dioxide emissions and that conservation efforts should focus on particularly vulnerable species and regions. A very important report highlighting the need to act before we run out of time. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Before we go, we want to announce that we now have an official seven days of science email that we would like to encourage scientists to contact us on if you have any upcoming or recent research that you would like us to cover. It's called 7dos.stories at gmail.com. We hope that by having this email, we can foster a greater partnership between the 7 Days of Science show and active researchers. And perhaps we can even bring attention to science stories that might not otherwise get a lot of coverage. So please do get in contact with us if you are a researcher yourself, or if you're based at an institution, or know scientists who may be interested in having their work featured. Also, we'd love to hear from our audience if you have any suggestions for how we can improve the show. Please leave a comment or contact us at this new email and let us know what you enjoy most about the show or what you think could be improved in terms of its structure, the topics we cover, or our presentation style. We always want to make 7 Days of Science better, so do tell us how you think we can achieve that. Anyway, you can follow 7 Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok, and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. As always, a big thank you to our patrons including Andrew Kawam, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Baffer, Diana Hernandez, Drav Srivastava, Gabriella, Gary Arrington, Giotist, I Rage, John French, Joseph Ree, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Priya Prajika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Petrikus, Schlom, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy N. Tedrow and Troy Schmidt. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week.